Hi everybody, Ty here, and welcome to The Glassy Garden. Still not sure exactly what this channel is all about, but we're going to start with some terrariums for some local species. So as you see, I love to drink iced coffees. Maybe a little too much. Man, this is a lot of plastic waste. See, I go through so many of these, it only feels right if I recycle them the best I can. What have I been doing with them? Well, I've been using them as temporary enclosures for some crawlies, specifically the cellar spiders. I will be giving scientific names for species when I can, as well as common names. I'll post them in the description down below. So, these containers are clearly too small to keep them long term, so I'll be performing a rehousing today for my cellar spiders, as well as specimens of stone centipedes, rathkai woodlouse, millipedes, darkling beetles, and as a bonus, rehousing of some lucky bamboo. So our first specimens are these guys in their thrifted homes, my cellar spiders, a species name Fulcus phalangoides. In this setup, I had two pairs that I was trying to breed and a communal setup with three spiders. This pair is my original pair, York and Morticia. This is my smaller pair, Hamlet and Ophelia. And lastly, my communal container with Aaron, Ogumi, and Buck. Buck here, Buck is a jerk. This species can be kept communally as long as resources allow, but Buck here bullies the smaller spiders, keeping them away from food and water and generally being a nuisance. If he keeps misbehaving after the relocate, I may have to release him. So I've already assembled some vertical enclosures based on those made for behavior studies performed by Rausch and Radabau. Uh, link in the description. We're using a vertical setup today because these guys are web hanging spiders. So we've got a tall container and poles for anchoring points so they have as much area for webbing as they can. Give it a quick miss so the environment has some community and we're good to go. As of recording this footage, I only have the phone with no stand at my disposal so we'll see if we can do this with one hand. If not, I may have to do a few cuts. Come on, girl. Okay, she's gonna escape if I don't actively keep her at bay, so you'll see the finished product. Why are you making this so difficult? Okay, so the enclosure's loaded with our breeding pairs. Now we'll set up our second communal. You may be wondering why there are just spools of cobweb in the middle of these poles. Well, spinning web takes a lot of energy from the spiders. And for a spider like this, their web's everything. The process of rehousing them sadly destroys their web, and in the wild, spiders that relocate usually consume their web to try and reclaim some of that energy. And this web here is to help them refuel a little and give a good starting point to spin from. Alright, these guys were much easier to load in, and here we are. Next up, we're housing a pair of stone centipedes, a species Lithobias forficatus. And they're still only peedlings. At this size, they're still transparent, but their color and length will increase with each molt. A general rule of thumb is to give centipedes a substrate at least as deep as their body length, so they can dig adequate burrows. I've chosen a nice loose substrate for them, and I'll make the soil deeper to accommodate them as they grow. Um, as per their namesake, they like to hide under stones, so I've included a few tumbled agates, both as stone cover and for decoration. I've kind of started some burrows here just because of how small they are, and I'm not 100% sure how much trouble they'll have digging in the substrate. Um, because they're so tiny, I'm going to be very careful picking them up, and I'm going to use this soft, fine paintbrush. And they went f underground faster than I could record. Centipedes have very fast reflexes, and as you can see, it can easily catch you off guard. So there's this little guy, and there he goes. I guess he had no trouble burrowing into that soil after all. 
Our next housing is a batch of black millipedes, uh, likely of the Omatoilus genus. Uh, the exact species is a little tricky to ID, but my current guess is that these are Portuguese black millipedes, uh, species Omatoilus morletti. Like the centipedes, uh, there are stones for them to hide under and a loose substrate around their body length for burrowing. Um, where the substrate's soft, we'll just pour these guys in. Now, millipedes are very shy, and they may stay curled up for a little while before looking for somewhere to burrow. While most of our specimens today are ground-dwelling and nocturnal, these guys will probably be our most cryptic, and unless the population goes up a lot, we likely won't be seeing much of them. Uh, leaf litter is an important component to a millipede enclosure, and while some is mixed in already, I have some leaves from my house plants that I've cleaned and dried, and I'll be putting those in as well. Next up, we have a small colony of isopods. Uh, judging by the nice yellow crown spot on the mature adults, my ID for these will be Rathkai woodlouse, or species uh, Trachylipus rathkai. Uh, these little guys have similar requirements to millipedes, but are a little more active and have pretty well-documented behavior. I'll put them in a different container that'll hold humidity better, so swapping containers in 3, 2, 1, BAM! New enclosure. A handful of stones and substrate along with some wood and additional leaves, this time from a long-deceased houseplant, a dwarf pomegranate. You will be missed, tiny palm. So anyways, now we'll add these guys in, and as you can see, these guys are very healthy and active, already going to explore their new enclosure. So isopods do require a good amount of humidity. Um, they are land-dwelling crustaceans and breathe through modified gills, so they need to be kept damp. Um, but some species do like a drier microclimate in their habitat as well. And since the requirements specifically for rathkais, doesn't seem to be known uh, for now. I'll just spray along a moisture gradient so there's an option if they do prefer a drier climate. Next up we have a few sand-dwelling darkling beetles. Uh, identifying the precise species is a little tricky since species with the same body type tend to look similar. Looking at an ID guide I do have for my province though, I think the most likely species is uh, Melanastis acutus. Since these guys don't really have a common name, I'll either refer to them by their binomial name or obsidian darklings, since they match the color of the stone in their enclosure. Speaking of their enclosure, here it is. Uh, the substrate's reptile sand with dried out vegetation from the dwarf palm, and a snowflake obsidian and sunstone on opposing corners. Uh, I'll be replacing some of the dry vegetation with live plants once our weather improves here, but this gives a bit of variation for now. I have cut out a little hide from a bottle cap, and it may not look naturalistic in this enclosure, but it provides shelter and the beetles like it. These guys are not picky for hides, and if they want some privacy, they'll hide under just about everything. They'll even bury themselves in the substrate if it's loose enough. Now, unless I can get them conditioned and habituated to my presence, uh, any footage of these guys or pictures will likely have them from afar. They're really skittish, and their main defense is to play dead. That's what's going on here. He's playing dead, I swear. Our last specimen today is this trio, a lucky bamboo in a bottle. Now, these guys have had a rough journey. These guys were originally houseplants owned by a friend of mine in university. Yes, you know who you are. He gave me this bamboo as both a parting gift and a rehouse when we were moving back to our respective hometowns. Uh, it was put in this water bottle as a temporary container, but in the chaos of moving and renovating spaces, rehousing kind of kept getting pushed back, so it's been in this container for way longer than it should have been. Its health until recently has been fairly consistent, so it's shown itself to be a pretty hardy species to me, but it's time to give them a proper container. Now, this is why common names are generally unhelpful for learning a lot for a hobbyist or biologist. This species is known as Lucky Bamboo, or Chinese Water Bamboo, but both are an inaccurate name, so this species, which is species Dracania sanduriana, 
is not from China. It's from Eastern Africa. It's also not a bamboo, but it's actually a member of the asparagus family. Now, if you're going to use soil for this species, make sure it's loose and drains well. This species does require lots of water, but its roots are also prone to being smothered and sick in waterlogged soil. So if this soil doesn't drain well enough, I may have to try a hydroponic setup instead. So the tips of the stems have gotten sick or died off, so we'll just prune off the dead portions of the stem to avoid any damage to the living parts. So there you have it. We've rehoused all of our specimens and they're all adjusting to their new enclosures. So what do I do with these cups now? Well, I actually do have an idea for what I'm going to do with them, but that I will keep as a surprise for another day. Until then, thank you for watching. If you'd be interested in seeing more content like this and learn some more about some Acadian region species, just feel free to leave a comment down below. Thank you so much for watching, and you have a great day. Bye!